One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three. We're approaching Anaheim now, almost there. Turn right at the next corner, Harbor Boulevard, and here we are at Disneyland. We hope that it will be unlike anything else on this earth. A uh, fair, uh, amusement park, an exhibition, a city from the Arabian Nights, metropolis from the future. In fact, a place of hopes and dreams, facts and fancy, all in one. In Disneyland, Walt turned the fantasy and imagination of films into three-dimensional reality. And it was a show in which everyone could play a part. For guests, Disneyland was the stage. And each of the lands was a separate show where the actors and audience mingled together. But unlike a finished film, the Disneyland show would continue to develop. I wanted something live, something that I could, that could grow, something I could keep plussing with ideas. You see? The park is that. And I think Disneyland Paris has actually taken advantage, in the best sense of the word, of everything that went before it. I think the other uh, point that should be made about Disneyland Paris is how much inspiration Walt took from Europe, whether it was Tivoli in terms of Disneyland or the, the great stories that became the Disney animated classic, Snow White and Pinocchio. And they're, they're, they're all uh, the European stories in the early days and uh, European authors. And uh, then for Disneyland, the new Schwanstein Castle. And I think the idea of Walt taking back, Walt, the Walt Disney Company now, taking back to Europe uh, a park that represents in many ways so much inspiration that came from Europe was uh, pretty uh, magical in, in a lot of ways and, and makes us all feel good that uh, we were able to do this, I guess, for Walt Disney. As you can imagine, uh, going into Europe where there is such a rich history of the most unbelievable architecture and design and art that can be imagined um, was, shall we say, off-putting at first because um, you know, much of what makes Disneyland special in California is the attention to detail and the, and the, the beauty of our, our work which we've painstakingly tried to bring, I think, some of Europe to Southern California in many cases. Um, now going back to where all this was taken from originally, a whole different challenge, I think, laid before us. And that challenge of what detail did we need to put in there to stand um, comparable with the great things that were down the street in Paris. And it was my goal throughout it to take the best of what we've done three times before in, in California, Florida, and Tokyo and put it together in what I was determined was going to be the most beautiful and best park that we'd ever done. And I'm convinced that's what we did. Main Street is an optimistic place. The reason we have a berm around the park is when you go under the train station, and of course, Marty Sklar explains this, and we still have this uh, principle, is that the portals of the railroad station are like the gateways to a movie theater. So you buy your popcorn, you get your tickets and everything, just like you get your tickets at Disneyland, right? And when you pass under those portals, just like going to the seats on the left or the right side of the movie house, here at Disneyland, instead of finding a bunch of empty seats and a blank movie screen, you step through the screen. And that was a responsibility we had, was to put you into the film, to put you into an environment, to create a seamless world. All those main streets share that, and they share an optimistic, uh, imaginative view of the world. When you walk into Disneyland, everything's okay. This is a town that doesn't have any crime. The, the vehicles run day in, day out. All the citizens are happy to see you, just like you're a local. It's a place like no other in the world. So those are the basic dynamics of all of our Main Streets. But I would say that the settings of Main Street, because it was derived from Walt Disney's uh, hometown of Marceline, Missouri, he lived in the Midwest. He was, a, he was a farm boy. And what he noticed as time was going on is that the little town that he remembered, little towns all over America were disappearing. 
Big cities were springing up in the 1920s and 1930s. Those simple, slow, small town life, things being made by hand, that was all disappearing. So when he did Disneyland, he wanted to create a nostalgic place that he remembered. And that's where the real Disneyland Main Street is. It's scale, it's very tiny, it's, it's very intimate in its sense. It's a little small Midwestern town. Interesting thing too is Walt Disney in the story of Main Street showed, and you'll see this in Paris too, a sense of transition from gas to electric. But you'll see gas lights on the street and electric lights. It was a city in transition. And I think uh, even the vehicles, you have horse-drawn streetcars. That clip-clop sets the tone for it, even in the music that surrounds it. Imagine, you know, Main Street, and you're in the movie now, there's no seats. It has a rich score. So you're hearing the music around you, you can sense the environment. Horses are moving at a slow pace. Um, even the, the engines of the cars, the mufflers we choose to get the vehicles to have the right putt, 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 putt kind of cute sound to them or charming sound to them. It's all nostalgic. It's not overthought. It has a simplistic innocence about it. How can we position this product in such a way that our audience understands without words? without dialogue, that they're in America, they can feel the optimism of America, and they can also feel the energy and excitement and sort of aggressive nature of what it's like to be in America and have that feeling. So everything from the billboards that are on tops of the roofs behind me, all of these things make up the, the look of the street. So when you walk in, you think you are on vacation to a foreign place. The idea of, of Frontierland in Disneyland Paris is that we wanted to tell a story of the American gold rush. Now, uh, people had heard of the idea of uh, a gold rush, the phenomenon that took place in California in, in 1848. The idea of instant uh, fortune the idea of becoming rich overnight. Stories came out that, that nuggets as large as your fist of gold were being found. A lot of these were, were totally fabricated, but many of them were true. And, and they were true enough to bring much of the world, either by boat or traveling across the country uh, by wagon, to what started in California and spread throughout the Southwest. What we decided to do was to make the icon the mountain, Big Thunder Mountain, where, where the, the gold strike took place. And, and then from the Big Thunder Mining Company, Moving out from there, we began to establish where would the different city shops, the, the uh, saloons, the uh, restaurants, uh, how would this have, have uh, evolved in a, a gold mining town? as was the case with Thunder Mesa, we felt it was important to show other aspects of the, uh, the movement toward the West, that it wasn't just for gold, but that gradually it, it began to attract families from the East who would put all their worldly belongings into a Conestoga wagon and, and, and head on out uh, trying to set up a farm, uh, a ranch, um, these kinds of things. Um, 
and we included that as well with our Cottonwood Creek Ranch and the, the barn, the, the whole domestic element of, of the West. We have Phantom Manor. Well, it was at one time probably the grandest residence in this whole upper class neighborhood and now has fallen into disrepair because a lot of times as quickly as people earned or made their money, they lost it. And that is what you see perched on the hillside. And the, the spirit of the once proud owner is there to welcome us, as it were, to now his, his happy haunt, which is Phantom Manor. For the whole idea behind Adventureland for Paris, we have to go back to the original Disneyland in uh, California back in the 1950s. Um, at the time, Walt Disney was producing a series of Academy Award-winning documentaries called True Life Adventures. And it was from those uh, documentary series of films that he pulled some ideas for the Adventureland area. In fact, the original name for that area was going to be called True Life Adventureland and eventually it got shortened to Adventureland. Adventureland in Disneyland Paris uh, is different from the other Adventurelands existing, the other three, in that, number one, it has a major presence on the hub. The uh, other Adventurelands are quite, uh, I would say, understated approaching from the hub. They can consist of a bamboo structure with some palm fronds or something like that and a signage. Uh, we wanted a major presence and a portal, an entry, just like Frontierland has next door with their fort, Fantasyland has with their castle, so we uh, created the bazaar. Uh, the bazaar is drawn upon heavily from the uh, Thousand and One Tales of Arabian Nights stories. We wanted to give it a fantasy slant, something we could layer uh, colors and texture and story onto. The original Adventureland was basically themed around the jungle, and uh, for many, many years, that's all that it entailed. Was and the uh, Adventurelands that followed for Florida and for Tokyo were pretty much the same jungle theme with uh, very little variance. Um, so when time came to do Disneyland Paris, we wanted to expand that theme, and uh, because adventure. Uh, encompasses much more than just the jungle. So we have the jungle, of course, but we also incorporated the Caribbean, uh, tropical islands, northern and central Africa, and arid deserts. Um, we just try to get as much fun in that, that land as we could. In our existing parks, um, the uh, California Florida and Tokyo parks, we have a Tom Sawyer's Island, which is quite traditional for Frontierland. And uh, we wanted to do something different. Um, we came up with the idea for Adventure Isle, which uses those elements of Tom Sawyer's Island, the play areas, the caves, the tunnels, the uh, um, fun things to do. And we combined it with some of the other existing um, attractions, like the Swiss Family Robson Treehouse, the uh, Captain Hook's Pirate, ship, Skull Rock, and it's actually um, based on three Walt Disney movies, the Swiss Family Robinson, Peter Pan, and Treasure Island, all combined to make one attraction. Pirates of the Caribbean probably is the most popular Disney attraction ever created. Uh, since its premiere at the original Disneyland in 1967, uh, it remains the popular attraction to this day uh, in all three parks, all four parks now. Um, the Disneyland Paris Pirates, we had the opportunity to make it just a little bit better, a little bit bigger, and to change a few things around that um, to make it, the story flow a little bit better.
Fantasyland is the land within the Magic Kingdom that celebrates the great classic fairy tales of all time and also the Walt Disney films that feature those very same stories. It is somewhat uh, front and center stage within the parks and it's the land that contains the um, highest degree of, of the Disney characters and the product that the Disney studio has produced over the years. And um, of course has the castle as the icon and as the main entrance for the land. Uh, Fantasyland, I, I would say that the idea behind Fantasyland is it's this magical kingdom um, through which you can fly over moonlit London or experience the perils of Snow White or go into Alice's maze. So there's so many wonderful things and we needed a context for it and um, logically a kingdom, a medieval kingdom uh, was, the, was the right selection for the place that all of these stories would be told. Well, Fantasyland is really a timeless realm. We do have to select or imply some sort of time setting for it. So it's anywhere between the Middle Ages and the turn of this century. The European kingdom setting allows you to integrate and incorporate all of those different influences and different times in what we call a seamless way that allows these different geographies and these different time places to coexist with one another and not uh, cry out for attention or call attention to themselves. Fantasyland at Disneyland Paris we decided uh, would be best if we took the various stories and clustered them together in areas that were representative of the lands that those those fairy tales take place within. So for example, the stories of Peter Pan, Alice in Wonderland, and Mr. Toad all take place within an area that is evocative of merry old England. The stories of Sleeping Beauty and Cinderella take place in an area that's evocative of France. We have a, an Italian area with a Bella Notte Pizzeria. And we have an area that is um, Alpine in its flavor, where we tell the story of Snow White and Pinocchio, and we have a marionette restaurant. We have areas that celebrate um, the flavors and the feelings of Hans Christian Andersen in Denmark and Holland. We have a windmill and a canal boat ride. So we just thought that that would that that there's a there's an energy that's created by clustering these things together, as opposed to just randomly uh, breaking them apart throughout the land. That there's that there's that overused word synergy <laughs> that brings those those elements together and makes it even more fun and more imaginative. All of the ride vehicles and all of the rides in general are designed to accommodate um, children and, and adults. Like everything in a Disney park, it is not designed down um, to the child. It is designed up for the adult so that adults will enjoy it, children will enjoy it, and everyone of every age in between will find something of interest in the land. And that's why you see such an abundance of beautiful landscaping and wonderful, richly detailed architecture, the music, the food, table service restaurants. All of these are designed to appeal to a broad range of audience. I would say the overall look for Discoveryland is really meant to be one uh, that is timeless. What Discoveryland is, it's an actual collection of different futures. Um, different futures that, uh, that throughout time everyone has dreamed and believed in. So this collection of futures is really what, is what makes it timeless. Innovation is really the key of what Discoveryland is all about. So instead of dreaming about the future and calling it Tomorrowland, we decided to dream about discovering new ideas and innovation, and that's why we made the change. The difference between what has been the Tomorrowland and Discoveryland really is reflected in the name. We wanted to make something that clearly 
was a unique uh, location. In the 50s, when Disneyland opened, there was always this great dream of the future. There was always this dream of something beyond tomorrow. You know, it's like someday things are going to happen. Well, there's a funny thing about the future now, in that the future is, is the cliche is the future just isn't what it used to be. So the intent was actually go back to the concept of, of what is really important. And what's important is that man has always dreamed about the future. Looking at the other lands, we asked ourselves, what makes things timeless? In the other lands, you have a collection of locations. For example, in uh, Adventureland, you have a Caribbean location, an African location. And what it is, it's a collection of exotic places. So, and this is true with all the other lands. So what we decided for Discovery Land is let's take a collection of ideas. Every, as I said earlier, every generation's had dreams of the future. Now what we decided is to also pay a tribute to some of the great European visionaries, people like Jules Verne and H.G. Wells and Leonardo da Vinci and, and people like that. So throughout the ages, we've all dreamed of different futures, so why not do a collection of different futures? And that's what Discovery Land is all about. It isn't about one future, it's about many futures. There's actually a Jules Verne future. There's even a Michael Jackson and a George Lucas future, if you will. By doing so, it doesn't date itself every five years. It actually makes it timeless. Numerous references have been made to Jules Verne because he was a tremendous visionary and inspiration to us. And there have been numerous quotes but one of my favorites, even though we might paraphrase it, was that if you can dream it, you can do it. And I think that throughout the course of Discoveryland, and in a, in a smaller, and in a bigger sense, all of Disneyland Paris, but especially for us, because we were in the process of creating something totally new, um, we did dream it, and we did do it. And that, again, is the most is the most gratifying. So we take from Jules Verne, you know, his stories and his ideas, but we also take his inspiration. I think one of the most important details that we sometimes overlook in the design end, but I know it's really important on your end, is cast members, because literally what they wear, how they conduct themselves, how they continue the experience that they that we've created in wood and stone and plaster and everything is so important to what the guest takes away. You are the story of what we're doing and cast members are the actors in the scene. Nobody goes out of a movie theater saying that was the greatest set I've ever seen. Everybody comes out saying I love the performance and uh, we at Imagineering um, put our work in your hands to maintain, to keep beautiful, to maintain the concept, the vision, the idea, and the spirit and the smile. And uh, that's what I think it's all about. If you understand the stories and you can keep that story going, we've led the people to the place, we've taken them on an enchanted journey up to your front door, and now you are the host because it's really in your hands.